Hello, welcome to this presentation that will describe the less common species of dragonflies and damselflies occurring in Britain. In this presentation, I'm going to be looking at the 21 least common species of the 45 that we know breed in the UK. If you want um, to look at the commoner species, then there's an accompanying YouTube video um, entitled The Common Species. Um, and there's also an introductory presentation video covering the biology um, and the general introduction to Britain's dragonflies. So you can find, find these either on my YouTube channel or the British Dragonfly Society's YouTube channel. And if you want to read more about any of these, of course, then by all means, have a look at this wonderful book. So just a little quick recap. We have um, basically 12 groups that we could put our dragonflies and damselflies into. Um, of these, half of them, there are six groups of damselflies and six groups, if you like, of, of dragonflies. And the damselflies include the large demoiselles, which are both common and widespread across Britain. The blue tails, one of which is very common and one of which is not. The spread wings, uh, one of which is common but declining and others which are rare. The bluets, uh, a couple of which are very common and others which are much less common. The red damsels, one of which is very common and another of which isn't. And then the red eyes, both of these are common and covered in the other presentation. The dragonflies include the chasers, one of which is relatively scarce. The skimmers, uh, two species which are both quite common and covered in the other presentation. And the darters, some of which are common, others of which are much less so. Of the hawkers and emperors, we have a mix of both common and rare species. The golden ring and club tail we've lumped together for convenience, but the golden ring is, is pretty common and widespread, particularly in the west of Britain. The club tail much more restricted. And then we have emerald dragonflies and the emeralds are all rather scarce and local. So a recent analysis of 50 years worth of data in the UK showed that um, these 21 species, the ones I'm going to cover here, um, had the lowest frequencies of occupancy in one kilometre squares or monads. And the results of this, if you're interested, are available in much more detail in the state of dragonflies in Britain and Ireland 2021. But you can see there in that listing, we've got Willow Emerald at 5.5% occupancy, right down to the much um, more localised southern, northern and Irish damselflies. OK, so we have 10 uncommon damselfly species, which I'm going to cover here. And the commoner species have been greyed out. These you can find information on in the accompanying presentation. And then we have one damsel that's occurred as a vagrant, uh, the common winter damsel, of which there are just a couple of records up to 2022. Dragonflies, we also have 11 uncommon breeding species. And again, the commoner ones are greyed out. There's a few alternative names in brackets there that are used more widely across Europe. And then bottom right, we have quite a long list of migrants and vagrants. Uh, so species that um, 
may or may not occur annually. Most of them don't occur annually. And I'm, I'm not going to be covering these. We have no proof of successful breeding of, of any of these species. So I'm afraid you'll have to uh, have to buy Britain's dragonflies if you want to see more details on those. The small red damselfly is the smaller of two red species of damselflies that we have in Britain. Now the large red is very common and widespread, but the small red, as you can see from the map, is very localised, mainly in southern uh, England and West Wales. Um, it's very much a habitat specialist and um, often found associated with bog mosses on heathland, ponds and uh, flushes and um, sometimes on the, the moorland fringe but typically it likes fairly warm areas and it is very localised so even within those shaded areas um, it's not particularly common. Now that little uh, phrase the small red is all red is a good one to remember because the small red lacks the black towards the tip of the abdomen that the large red shows. It can sometimes be difficult to see the dark markings on the tip of a, a large red um, because they're shiny and in bright sunlight um, they sometimes glint and look pale. So if you think you've got a small red look for other clues as well. Um, just bear in mind of course that mostly you're not going to be seeing small reds because they're so localised. But the small red also has nice red wing spots instead of black wing spots in the large red. And the legs are distinctly reddish or pinkish instead of the black legs of a large red. So there's a large red for comparison and it is indeed a, a more substantial insect than the small red. So quite quite a bit bigger and chunkier and bold and flies around much more quickly. The small red is very weak and low flying. There's the, uh, the thorax of a small red. Notice on top of the thorax no sign of any stripes, any pale red or, or yellowish stripes that the large red shows. And then on the side of the thorax there's this quite complex pattern of, of dark and pale lines and wedges, much more complex than you'll notice on the side of a large red. It's a midsummer species. It flies rather later than the large reds, uh, which are typically the first damselfly to emerge in the spring. So the small red comes out, it's a midsummer species and fizzles out pretty much during August. It has three, like other damselflies, it has several different colour forms and these are three that uh, you can see in Britain. The, the typical one, the commonest one at the top there, is mostly black above with um, a fair bit of red towards the tip of the abdomen and a little bit at the base too. There is a rather confusing all dark form which is shown there in the middle illustration. Look for the red divisions between the cells, between the segments towards the tip of the abdomen and those, those will give you a hint of what you're looking at. And then there is a, a, a much less common all red form that looks very like the male. Moving on now to the emerald damselflies, which, as you remember, are the spread wings. They hold their wings open, typically. So we have um, a, a lookalike here, one that's very similar to the commoner emerald damselfly or common spread wing that we see widely across Britain. The scarce emerald is very localised, as you can see from the map there, and uh, uh, tends to occur at similar sort of times from midsummer onwards. Um, but it shares with common emerald damselfly the blue pruinescence at each end of the abdomen. Um, it also shares, you know, nice uh, greeny bronze upper parts to most of the abdomen and the thorax and some blue pruinescence around the sides of the thorax too. But there are some subtle differences. So first of all, focus on trying to see the detail of the second abdominal segment. At the base of the abdomen 
there's quite a large segment which is only partially blue. There's a fairly distinct area of dark and that's different. The common spread wing has um, completely blue segment too. And if we look at the tip of the abdomen, if you can get a high quality photograph taken from above, you will be able to see the detail of the appendages. And in the scarce emerald, the inner or lower appendages are hockey, ship, hockey stick shaped. Um, so they curl in noticeably at the tip. And if we compare that with this emerald damselfly, you can see the lower appendages are almost straight. The female scarce emerald has the first abdominal segment squarely cut off in terms of the dark greenish pattern on the top. So it has a, a rather square sided edges instead of rounded edges. Um, there's a, an illustration showing what I mean. Now here's another um, new kid on the block. The willow emerald damselfly, or the willow spreadwing, has invaded Britain from the southeast. It spread quite substantially. That map is now superseded by a more recent one, which um, shows spread to the northwards particularly, and to some extent westwards. And um, as of 2022, there were further uh, spread f further new locations recorded and um, I think we fully expect it to spread further westwards and maybe even northwards. They seem to have found a niche um, here in Britain that they're occupying. They will often be found in trees. The name willow gives you a bit of a clue there but they can often be found perching above head height. Uh, they lay eggs into the um, branches, the little branches of willows and other um, trees and shrubs growing on the water side and they leave scars behind which uh, will help you to identify where they're present. So you can actually do a little bit of dragonfly recording during the winter with these. They're a, a, a late season species and with increasingly mild autumns we've been seeing them quite well into the autumn, into October or even November. But typically they're a late emerging species. They're a big emerald species. They don't have the pruinescence shown by the robust and the common spread wing. Um, they, they have plain green or bronzy upper parts and quite a, a large relatively pale wing spot. I mean don't forget that all dragonflies and damselflies when they first emerge have a pale wing spot. So don't be fooled by looking at young emerald damselflies. There are other clues to these to look at. They often hold their wings out a little bit further than other spread wings. And the um, male, sorry, the male and the female both have a very distinctive pattern on the side of their thorax. So the line, the division between the green above and the yellowish below has a spur. So there's a sort of zigzag marking quite prominent. You do see a little semblance of that sometimes in the robust spread wing in, in the scarce emerald damselfly, but nowhere near as clear as these. And again, if, if they're perched up in trees, there's every chance there'll be a willow emerald. There we are, that's where the zigzag is. So look for that spur. Looking at the tip of the male, we can see the appendages are actually structurally very different to the robust and common spread wing. So they have mainly pale whitish or ivory colored um, upper or outer appendages with a dark tip. And then the inner or lower appendages are very short. You can hardly see them. So that's a, a good clue that you're not looking at one of our commoner emerald species. The female 
has a very robust ovipositor. So the eggs are laid into that woody material. You can see there the pattern of egg scars left on um, a twig. Um, that robust ovipositor actually has a serrated um, edge underneath used for literally sawing into that woody material or slightly softer woody material that they go for. Um, so a more robust ovipositor than the other spread wings. We've had another um, rather faltering invasion, I suppose, by the southern emerald damselfly or migrant spread wing, um, which uh, has focused very much on southeast England. We do now have a few colonies seemingly um, breeding successfully each year. But this is a species that even more so than the other spread wings associated with temporary waters. So um, ephemeral ponds which may dry out um, and you will sometimes find them in dry areas, even egg laying in dry areas where they're anticipating or perhaps hoping that there is going to be autumn rainfall and hence subsequently a nice pond there for the larvae to live in. But it's still uh, not widespread and um, a very special one to look out for. The very distinctive feature of these is the fact that they have a black and white wing spot. So they're, um, well, I was going to say unique, but of course the blue tail damselflies have dark and light wing spots. Um, the southern emerald damselfly has even more conspicuous ones. They, the emeralds all have quite large rectangular shaped wing spots, and these are particularly obvious. You can also see that this male has um, very pale um, appendages and some rather clear yellow stripes on the top of the thorax. Otherwise, it's a rather nice pale yellow and bronzy green colour. No pluinescence. So there's the black and white wing spot, which is a good one to focus on. You can see on this individual, the thorax has those clear yellow stripes on the top. And also look behind the eyes. You can see a clear division between the dark upper side of the eyes and the rather yellowish lower side. So a very distinctive feature if you've got a close view of them. Here's a mature male. So they do go rather bronzy and actually this one has got just a teensy bit of pruinescence there. It's got a little bit pruinose on that terminal segment and there's actually just a slight hint between the wing bases on that image of the thorax. Um, but you can see there's quite a bit of pale towards the tip of, of the abdomen. Um, the scarce blue-tailed damselfly as I mentioned just now, shares with the blue tail those black and white wing spots. But it is a very localised red list species um, with some subtle differences from the much commoner, in fact, very common blue tail damselfly. You can see from the map, there's quite a scattered distribution. Um, it's often in new ponds so occasionally even in uh, temporary waters like uh, tractor ruts in a quarry or a new pond that's been created in, in a quarry or elsewhere. But there are some more permanent colonies on lowland heathland particularly, occasionally going up into the moorland areas. But typically it's a, it's a, a southern Mediterranean species like the small red, it likes quite hot. Um, conditions, so uh, a definite focus towards the south. And um, it is found on, on some moorlands and heathlands, so the New Forest, for example, heaths and uh, moors like Dartmoor and the moors of southwest Wales can have them. And there they're often associated with muddy areas where livestock have stopped the vegetation from becoming dominant. So this is a species that likes 
early successional stages. Um, so without too much vegetation. In terms of its identification, focus in the males on the tip of the abdomen. And instead of having a blue segment eight, we have a blue segment nine and part of segment eight and actually part of segment 10 too. So the whole blue segment is shifted towards the rear. Otherwise, quite similar. Um, you do get some blue tails that also look quite small in size. So the fact that it's a, a tiny species isn't um, an automatic guide to its identification. It's um, a midsummer species, let's say, but there are hints that in very warm years, and particularly in, the, in warm locations in the south, we might have two generations. So we may have a, um, a spring emergence and then possibly a late summer one. Here's the tip of the abdomen there showing um, one of a number of variations in black patterning that there can be, particularly on segment nine. There is the segment eight blue on the blue tailed damselfly for comparison. So you can sh see the position is shifted to the rear. The female scarce blue tailed, um, as with other damselflies, comes in several forms. And the immature form is this lovely orange color. Um, so the base of the abdomen and much of the thorax are this really nice orange and even orange spreading into the wing veins on the front of the wings. So that's a quite a, a good um, find. Uh, the chances are it's recently emerged and so you've got a breeding colony there. That's the typical form. So it lacks any um, blue segment towards the tip of the abdomen as some of the blue-tailed damselfly females show. Um, and the pattern on the thorax tends to be um, dark on top, shading down to pale olivey blue on, on the sides of the thorax without any obvious blue or um, any obvious shoulder stripes, blue or otherwise. And there is a very rare blue form of the female that is shown here. So quite a lot of blue, as you can see on this. But notice that thorax pattern mirroring the orange of the one above. So that has matured into a, a blue color. OK, so now let's move on to the bluets or the blue damselflies. And here we're, we're looking at um, a mix of common and rare species. So we have the azure second from the left, which is uh, the very common one with a, that beer glass square U shape on segment two of the abdomen, the base of the abdomen. Um, not easy always to see the detail of the segment two markings because they're often covered by the wings. But what we might be looking out for, particularly in Fenland sites um, where the water is alkaline, is the variable damselfly there on the left, which has rather more black on um, basically all of the abdominal segments, really. Third one in from the left is the southern damselfly. So a, a very rare, highly localized species, very small. And that has those arrow shaped markings coming up the abdomen with a so-called mercury mark. Um, on segment two, so quite a complex pattern there. The northern damselfly, which is restricted to Scotland in Britain, has um, a sort of intermediate, I suppose, between azure and southern patterning, but uh, some suggestion of, of arrow shapes, um, particularly on segment three of the abdomen. And then um, those um, very characteristic um, mix of a sort of mushroom pattern and then side lines, if we can call them that, on the side of segment two. So not joined up. Irish damselfly goes a little bit further and loses the stalk on the mushroom. 
and uh, has much more dark uh, on the abdominal segments. The dainty damselfly, which is a recent uh, invader and very restricted to North Kent at the moment, um, has um, a slightly more restricted version of the variable damselflies um, wine goblet, we could call it, on segment two. Um, but it also differs from the other species in that it has two and a half black segments towards the tip of the abdomen. So um, in front of those rear blue segments, we've got one, two, and then half a segment that are black before we get to some more blue going further towards the head. So that two and a half black segments is worth looking out for. OK, so let's look at these in a bit more detail. The variable damselfly is um, quite variable, um, particularly in the females, of course, as we might expect. Um, it's uh, a very fragmented distribution, um, but seemingly spreading in parts of the um, east of its range in England. It's rather more widespread in Ireland. And as I say, it's mostly governed, we think, by alkaline water sources. So where you've got chalk or limestone in the area, um, draining into lakes or ponds or canals or ditches or even bogs on occasions, um, the variable might be found. Now, you do need to look closely. Generally speaking, the male has these broken blue stripes on top of the thorax. So a, a really quite dark appearance there generally. And then below that we can see the segment two wine goblet, quite a thick wine goblet. And towards the tip of the abdomen, um, that terminal segment has quite a large area of black, often a sort of bat shape. So there's our broken thorax stripes looking, if you like, if you want to use your imagination, like daggers dripping with blood. So a drop of blood below the point of the arrow there, dripping down into a wine goblet. So are we reminded of Count Dracula at this point? And if we go to the tip of the abdomen and look at that bat-like shape, um, maybe that's also looking a little bit like a vampire bat. So OK, so a few little um, memory joggers there you might like to think of. our wine goblet. The female comes in basically a dark form in which the abdomen is mostly black but this is a blue form and it does have um, a little bit more blue at the bases of those abdominal segments than in the blue form of azure damselfly which is the confusion species. The patterning towards the tip of the abdomen is sometimes distinctive in these, but it is variable. What you really need to look at to be absolutely sure of this is the pronotum. So that's the shield at the back of the head uh, in front of the thorax. And that has a trilobed rear margin. So that means instead of a rather nice plain um, smooth curve almost on the rear edge of an azure damselfly. We've got these bulges on the sides and then another little bulge in the centre. It's very hard to see, but you can pick it up sometimes with high resolution close images of these. The other thing that's perhaps easier and appears to be reliable is that azure damselflies, both male and female, have a pale bar between the eye spots. So inside from the eyes, we can see those sort of pear-shaped spots with a pale line um, on the female. In the male, these are blue, but that seems to be a good mark. And the azure damselfly um, maybe always lacks that pale line. So even if you can't get the detail of the pronotum, which, as I say, would be an ideal, then that may help. So that's what we're talking about. Here we've got an azure damselfly, or two um, different forms actually, different colour stages. 
so lacking that blue or yellowish line between the eyes. And the rear edge of the pronotum you can see more clearly on the male there. The male azure is, is rather rounded and not distinctly three lobes. That little red blob incidentally is a mite that's found a soft spot to, uh, to latch onto just there. So there's a graphic illustration of the rear edge of the pronotum of the azure and the variable. In the male you can see it lacks that blue terminal edge so it's not quite so easy to see the detail because you're often seeing that black central lobe against the black of the thorax. So southern damselfly or mercury bluet named after that mercury mark is extremely localized often found on very small stretches of streams on heathland typically um, but also in Hampshire, uh, Dorset on chalk rivers or on the ditches and streams associated with the lower stretches of those chalk rivers. So the Avon on the Test Valley. It's a midsummer species as many of these damselflies are, flying mainly in June and July and it's also prone to uh, not doing very much until the sun shines. So basically from late morning through to early afternoon on sunny days, nice warm sunny days, these are the times to go looking for southern damselfly. Here's a closer look down at the front end and we can see those arrow shapes on the abdomen pointing up towards that mercury mark, which is fairly clear even here um, seen through the wings. And there's the arrow markings. At least two of the segments will have a, a rather distinct arrow or rocket shape. The female, I'm afraid, is not very distinctive. Um, it's typically a, a, a dark, small, low flying, rather weak flying individual. Um, the pronotum is not especially distinctive and to be honest the best thing to do is to keep an eye open for the males as with most dragonfly and damselfly species most of what you see, nearly all of what you see in most species will be a male but look out for them, they're not so conspicuous and of course if you've got a male in tandem with a female then it's uh, almost certainly going to be the right species. The segments between the, um, sorry, the colour between the segments on the abdomen towards the tip are blue. And if you're on a heathland boggy site that's got small red damselfly and you've got the dark form of the small red there, then just be wary that the small red will have red or reddish lines between those segments and the southern damselfly will have bluish lines. But they are very similar to azure damselfly dark form so just just be warned um, not so easy in the female. The northern damselfly and the Irish damselfly I'm going to cover together. Northern as you can see is found in a few locations in Scotland um, being rather northern, it's definitely a, a midsummer species uh, flying in June and July um, in, in lakes and, uh, and smaller water bodies, uh, sometimes boggy water bodies with emergent um, rushes and sedges. The Irish damselfly is really quite scarce, um, perhaps scarcer than that map suggests and restricted to Ireland. and. Uh, is as you can see quite dark, plenty of black markings on the top of the abdomen with those um, distinctive um, detached black markings on the side of segment one. Um, it does tend to be rather greenish on the underside of the thorax in both male and female and in fact northern damselfly also shares that feature. 
a dainty damsel fly, a recent colonist, I said, basically restricted currently to North Kent. It was traditionally found in Essex at one location, but that was lost in, uh, in the drastic floods 50 years ago. But we have in, in the last decade or so seen um, these appearing at a few locations, only a handful of locations. It's possible that they get, they're overlooked and they are more widespread. They don't have a particularly um, stringent requirement for their habitat. It's um, a pond or, or a ditch, um, but with quite a lot of um, pondweed, particularly uh, near the surface where they're often found and, and will be found egg laying. Uh, they do wander away from water on, on occasion, so they might just turn up anywhere in, in a dry location. They are small, as the, nainty, as the name dainty suggests, um, and the males, as I mentioned earlier, have those two and a half black segments towards the, um, well, between the middle um, of the abdomen outwards. Um, and that rather small wine goblet shape on segment two. The female, um, most females tend to look like this. They have quite a lot of blue showing and they have very distinct um, rocket shapes on the top of the abdomen. So there's black rocket shapes. And then again, there's quite a, a large patch of blue towards the tip of the abdomen. Uh, although some variable damselflies show that as well. But rather distinctive females actually and well worth keeping an eye open for. Probably prone to blowing around on nice warm breezes, so it could well turn up anywhere um, in the south after or during a warm spell. Here's that segment two marking the small wine goblet. Now, every day you see an emerald is a red letter day. Downy emerald is a more um, widespread of the three emerald species we have in Britain and Ireland. The um, concentration is uh, in the southeast of England, but there are also some good locations, um, particularly in the Scottish Highlands. It's an early species. They um, tend to emerge um, at pretty much the same time around the middle of May in, in the south of England and um, that's often a time to find, find them still at their emergence perches. You can see the male there on the left um, is bronzy green with some lovely emerald green um, in places particularly on the thorax and the eyes so all the emeralds have lovely green eyes. They're flyers, they're not very keen on perching. So again, it's an even more of a red letter day if you find an emerald dragonfly perched so you can see it um, at your leisure. The downy in its name comes from quite a thick coating of hairs on the thorax particularly. And that's an adaptation shown by several early emerging uh, dragonfly species there and is thought to help them to warm up on those cool spring days. The male has um, what we technically call a blobby tip. So the base of the abdomen is rather wasted, um, quite narrow, and then it expands out towards the tip, right at the tip. And in flight, they hold their abdomen tip a little bit higher than the rest of the body. So it looks quite conspicuous. Quite a short abdomen. As I say, these are flyers rather than perchers. So you will often see these um, flying around the edges of a pond. Their ponds are their ponds and lakes are their favoured habitat, often with tree lines. So um, the, the larvae living in, in the leaf litter very often that comes from the overhanging trees. And you may see them flying in and out of um, the wooded fringe of a pond. And they will stop, pause and hover and maybe look at you um, 
in in a little bay perhaps um, and then move on so there's a, a, a rather typical view of one in flight showing that thickened tip held up above the horizontal the female shown there on the right of this illustration um, tends to have um, more parallel sides to the abdomen and these are not often seen and often when they are seen um, they'll either be grabbed by a male and taken off into the top of a tree to mate or they'll be egg laying often under the overhanging branches of trees. A brilliant emerald is much more localized with these um, fairly discrete areas in the southeast of England and in the Scottish Highlands. It's um, indeed a very brilliant emerald species so the whole of the um, eyes, the thorax and the abdomen are this lovely shiny green colour. Some occasionally may look um, dark depending on the light and maybe the age. They may go a little bit more bronzy with age and there are some limited um, to be fair some limited patches of yellow on the side of the, uh, the thorax and the base of the abdomen um, but these you're not generally going to see unless you have an opportunity to see one perched in close-up again the female has very parallel sides to the abdomen but the male has um, a much less conspicuous bulge and it's nearer the middle than the tip of the abdomen so not as exaggerated a shape as the downy emerald um, these tend to be a bit bigger as well so that abdomen is a little bit more stretched out i guess so there we are that's the, the sort of widest point is not so near the tip as it is in downy emerald Females have a, um, a very conspicuous ovipositor um, here. This one's being caught and is exuding some eggs, so a batch of eggs that they will dip into um, usually the margins of their water body, often into a sort of mossy or muddy, organic muddy area. And that almost vertically downward projecting ovipositor um, is very conspicuous and obviously comes in handy as they're laying these eggs in flight and uh, tip of the abdomen will be held up almost at right angles to the rest of the abdomen and to get it out of the way I think and then the ovipositor being jabbed down repeatedly to lay eggs but that's a rare sighting indeed. The male northern emerald um, is very similar to the other emeralds but much darker bronzier it flies over boggy areas it has very very um, distinct habitat preferences so these um, sphagnum bog moss areas and uh, they will patrol over and lay eggs into that the males have a very distinctive tip to the abdomen in that the appendages are caliper shaped so they look a bit like the rear end of an earwig but as you can see very localized and just a, um, a tiny presence in southwest Ireland. The scarce chaser is actually perhaps um, best referred to now as the blue chaser. Some people have uh, jokingly said the not so scarce chaser because it has increased its population and spread across the country particularly southwestwards and uh, it, it seems to be continuing that since this map was drawn there have been further records further to the west so it's something to look out for this is uh, a male photographed it has the classic um, dark wing bases of a chaser but they are really very restricted and not so easy to see they're often to be seen against a dark thorax um, which renders them almost invisible so you need to check that you haven't got a black tailed skimmer so the pale blue abdomen looks very like a black tailed skimmer it's a little bit fatter a little bit broader 
and not quite so long, not quite so elongated. And the black tip is a little bit more restricted. Some of the scarce chasers, particularly the females and immatures, have dusky tips to their wings, which is a useful feature. And when the males are mature, fully mature, they have these lovely steely blue eyes. So steely blue eyes, um, relatively broad abdomen, dark wing bases, maybe dark wing tips. The habitat is also um, a useful thing because they typically like slow flowing water. So the lowland stretches of rivers and drains, um, but also increasingly, it seems, moving on to still water or very slow flowing water in the case of canals. Um, so reedy ponds, lakes, and also reedy ditches and riverbanks is where they're found. The larvae living um, in the mud at the root, you know, at the base of these uh, this emergent vegetation. There's the dark wing bases, not always easy to see. One important thing about scarce chasers is they always perch off the ground, so they're never going to be sat flat on the ground, which is the classic position of a black-tailed skimmer. So if you think you've got a black-tailed skimmer perched knee high or waist high up on a, um, a piece of vegetation on the side of a watercourse, do look closely at it because that's quite likely then to be a scarce chaser. Those pale blue-gray eyes, dusky wingtip. Sometimes some males. Here's the broad-bodied chaser, which is what the one, of course, we're going to see much more widely and commonly. It has really got a very broad abdomen with much larger dark wing bases and brown eyes, dark eyes, instead of those steely grey eyes. Incidentally, the black tail skimmer has green eyes, or dirty green eyes, nothing like these pale blue-grey eyes on the scarce chaser. And there's the black tail skimmer for comparison, typically sitting there on, on a wooden platform, perched there, ready to leap up and chase other skimmers. Scarce chaser doing the same thing, but from a perch. Very occasionally you get black tail skimmer up on a perch, but it's quite rare. So just be aware of some of the colour changes happening in uh, dragonflies. The confusing immature stages, the tenorals when they first emerge, can look very similar to females, so a young male can be the same colour as a, as a female. This one is showing the shiny wings, so we know it's just emerged a few hours earlier. They have in this um, immature and the female form um, a series of bell shapes, black bell shapes down the centre of the abdomen. There it is a little bit older, an immature female with those bell shapes. And as the um, female matures, she'll go duller. They start off a beautiful fulvous um, yellow colour with um, quite extensive yellowish in the wing veins. And then they become dull, um, sometimes very dull greyish brown colour on the abdomen. This one, of course, retaining the dark wingtips. And there's an immature male, so steadily the uh, waxy Pruinescence comes through the cuticle and covers the abdomen. You can see the remnants of yellow down the edges of the abdomen there. But ultimately that will cover the black and, or most of the black, and certainly that uh, ochre colour to look like that. And there's a um, an unusual one, admittedly, but a very old female, and she's become a little bit pruinose and also got quite pale greyish eyes. But again, those dark wingtips would give you a hint as to what it was. 
Well, we have a, a few species of, of rare darters um, that are quite mobile and uh, prone to turning up in, in Britain, particularly during warm southerly or southeasterly airflows. A red veined darter is the most regular one that we pick up as a migrant or an immigrant, but it does appear to be also colonizing and every year we have breeding records from a few scattered locations, mainly in the south of Britain um, and mainly coastal to be fair. It uh, has on the continent and, and areas further south, it has two distinct generations, maybe even more in, in the far south. But in Britain, um, we often don't have a warm enough climate or a warm enough summer to allow a second generation to emerge. So what will happen is there may be an influx in May or June, and then there may be um, a further influx or emergence in late August and September uh, that could be that second generation. Another important thing about these is that they appear to be obligate dispersers. So when they emerge, they have an urge to fly away. So the immatures will often be found away from water. And it's very common um, across the continent, for example, to see them away from water. So again, common darters will do this as well. Um, and some ruddy darters will wander and probably also um, migrate or turn up on the coast as immigrants. Certainly common darters very often do that. Um, so it's worth keeping your eye open for red veined. So what makes a red veined a red veined darter? Well, obviously it does it what it does what it says on the tin, although they're not always that conspicuous. It has got red wing veins shown rather clearly here. Um, but it does also have a few other important features. So there on the side of the thorax is a single pale stripe, transverse stripe. Um, the red veined perches typically like this, are like a, a little flag on the top of a, um, a stalk blowing in the breeze very often. Um, and in those conditions, you'll see the pale stripe very easily. But also they spend time, um, perhaps even more so than common darters, uh, over water, hovering and zooming around over the middle of a, a pond or lake. And you can actually, through binoculars, often detect that pale line, that pale flash. When you get a good view of one at rest, have a look at the wing spots. And they have very obvious, bold, dark edges at the front and rear of the wing spot. So those the wing spot features are also present in females and immatures. The underside of the eyes is blue. Um, only a, the rare scarlet darter has blue eyes, uh, blue underneath the eyes. So if you've got a, a darter, male or female, um, that's got that little blue patch, you often need to be low down and looking from behind to see it, mind you. And quite nice. Uh, rufous red thorax and eyes and a pink face. So um, otherwise, yeah, those are characteristics of ruddy data rather than common data. Here's um, a fairly fresh female, again showing those um, bold wing spots and rather plain sides to the thorax in the case of these. Compare their top right with a common data. So the common data has those two bold yellowish patches separated by darker panels in the male common data. A data or white face, um, different genus to the other daters. The small white face or white face data is a boreal species. So it belongs in the north of Europe and is found predominantly now in Scotland, in the Highlands. There are a few locations. Some have been lost from southern England, but we have um, literally uh, three locations in the northwest Midlands, 
and uh, there are a few sites in Cumbria but the main areas are in the north the far north and it's one that is probably going to retreat further with a warmer climate it's an early emerging species coming out in May and persisting through June and into July the males are very attractive black and red um, with several features that distinguish them from other um, from the darters and one of those is dark wing bases quite small and not necessarily very conspicuous um, the male and female both have white faces not always easy to see unless you're looking head-on but they do have this um, rather irregular pattern of red in the male and yellow in the female and also yellow in the immature male um, there showing the upper parts so very attractive little darters um, and another thing to focus on is the white costa the wing vein across the front of the wing is pale and there's um, quite a pale patch just outside the wing spot so dark wing spots with white um, lines coming out along the wing veins there's a female black darter for comparison so these are found um, in the same sort of habitat as white-faced darters um, at least in lowland boggy areas they are very much a peat bog specialist so peaty bog pools um, in the case of both white-faced darter and the black darter but the black darter has that black triangle on the top of the thorax and much more yellow visible um, down the top of the abdomen from the sides they can look rather similar um, to white-faced darters but I think finding dark wing bases should help now common club tail isn't a very appropriate name for this species in Britain because it's far from common it's very localized along the more mature stretches of a few river valleys including the Thames, the Severn, the Wye, the Dee and the Arun. It's a common species or the most common let's say of the clubtail family across Europe hence that name but here a very special creature that's actually quite hard to find not only is it localized but when it emerges from these rivers it tends to fly away um, sometimes several kilometers into woodland glades and other areas of dense cover where it will feed up um, and return finally back to the rivers to perch on riverside vegetation often a leaf like this one or perhaps uh, even a, a stone a rock in the middle of the river or they may just patrol up and down looking for females so the club tails are unique in Britain in that the eyes are separated so in much the same way that damselfly eyes don't meet the club tails don't either so they have these rather nice green eyes but then generally black and yellow patterning quite a lot of black on the abdomen and quite complex black stripes on the thorax the club tail name of course comes from the fact that it does um, expand from a rather narrow base to the abdomen out towards that rather swollen tip it's an early emerging species so often emerging in concert from rivers in middle of May and it will be around until early July so June is perhaps the best time to see it in its riverside habitats unless you can catch them emerging along the river banks a common confusion species for those unfamiliar with it is the female or immature black-tailed skimmer which also has a rather bold black and yellow pattern although perhaps a richer yellow in the skimmer whereas the club-tailed males at least go a slightly greener uh, shade of yellow. 
the club the uh, club tail as i said has co complex pattern on the thorax whereas the black tail skimmer is relatively plain and typically um, sits on the ground rather than high up on a leaf Now we move on to the hawkers, these big dragonflies that seem to mostly spend quite a lot of time flying. Although the Norfolk hawker, or perhaps more aptly green-eyed hawker, does quite often perch up in tall vegetation like these reeds on, on the sides of uh, a lake or ditch where they often occur. So as the name suggests, they have been until fairly recently very much an East Anglian specialist around the Norfolk Broads but thankfully they've moved away from the coast and spread inland to the East Midlands in a few locations. Um, they are traditionally associated with water soldier which is a plant growing in the ditches of the Norfolk Broads and in a few locations away from East Norfolk and East Anglia uh, they've been found on lakes with water soldier in them but also in very recent years they've turned up at reed bed sites in the south of England so um, more quite recently in, in South Devon for example and uh, it's expected and hoped that there will be further expansion of the breeding range because this has been a highly endangered species threatened by sea level rise in East Anglia Obviously, salt water is, uh, is not a habitat tolerated by our freshwater loving dragonflies. So it's an early season species emerging in, in late May and flying in June and into July. It's a brown dragonfly, so a similar base colour to the more common brown hawker. But you can see here these have green eyes and they lack the golden suffusion in the wings that the brown hawker has. And uh, they do patrol, as I say, up and down uh, ditches or around the edges of reedy lakes and ponds, but they will perch up fairly often for a better view. Here's a closer look at a rather duller individual and you can see at the base of the abdomen there's a yellow um, triangle shape, an isosceles triangle that gives the species its scientific name. And those lovely green eyes. And there for comparison is a, is a brown hawker which does have additional pale markings down the abdomen, brown eyes and, and the golden suffusion on the wing. Brown hawker are late summer species, I should add, unlike the uh, earlier flight period of the Norfolk hawker. So here's a, a rather fine small hawker, uh, the southern migrant hawker, that has recently started to turn up in southeast uh, Britain and has been breeding in around the Thames estuary, particularly Essex and Kent. Um, but also appearing to now colonise other locations, including some inland sites. So there, um, ponds and ditches doesn't quite explain their habitat preference, and these males will often be seen um, on territory in dry areas. Dry areas, admittedly, um, on the fringes of wetlands, um, but they, um, they will quite often be found away from water. Now that's not to say that other hawkers aren't found away from water as well, which they are, but these will be territorial in these relatively dry areas. So the thing to look for in a southern migrant hawker is that um, almost entirely unmarked side to the thorax is rather attractive, slightly bluish um, colour. And of course, blue is very much a theme in this species, in the male anyway. The blue eyes, the lovely bright blue eyes, much brighter blue than a migrant hawker. And then a lot of blue patterning down the abdomen, again, more extensive blue than in the migrant hawker, which is the confusion species. It also flies earlier. So um, 
from I suppose late summer really but not persisting into the autumn so if you've got one in um, September or October it's more likely to be a migrant hawker but one to look out for definitely a blue eye is a really good mark the almost unmarked side to the thorax there's a migrant hawker for comparison so you can see there in flight the side of the thorax has big yellow patches separated by brown and um, very different to just those sparse dark lines on the side of the southern migrant hawker. The female, um, like other female hawkers, tends to be dark brown and yellow, though occasionally there are blue forms, as there are in the other hawkers, that, that may resemble the males. There's the female migrant hawker for comparison. So um, again, note the plain sides to the thorax in the southern migrant hawker, whereas the migrant hawker has a brown and yellow stripes on the side. The azure hawker is a threatened species in Britain found only in, in the Scottish Highlands. It's very much a bog specialist and there are concerns about its survival in a drier climate, um, particularly if, if bogs start to dry out. Um, there is a question mark over whether it still exists in South West Scotland. It has not been seen there for a number of years. But it's a midsummer species taking advantage of um, what sunshine can be found in, in Scotland. Often, um, perhaps most often, uh, encountered away from water, perched on or basking on a plain subject like um, a tree bark or, or even a, a plank of wood. And there the males showing extensive areas of blue on the abdomen, but almost no markings. Um, on the top of the thorax and again in the female. So compare, for example, with a common hawker, which would be the other possibility here, although flying later in the year mainly. Um, but uh, female um, common hawkers would show a little bit more yellow on the, uh, the top of the thorax. Um, the right hand one has a, a white line pointing to the eyes and the eyes on Azure Hawker meet in a narrow point. There's the common Hawker male for comparison, so nowhere near as much blue on the male and it is a big um, dragonfly, the common Hawker, um, but often found in, in similar habitats on the moorland. The Azure Hawker quite small by comparison. And there's the female common hawker. So usually showing some small stripes on top of the thorax and a yellow uh, costa. It's a brownish costa on the, um, the azure hawker female. And there's azure hawker in flight. So they have very distinctive um, wiggly blue lines on the side of the thorax in the case of the male. So nowhere near like the bold straighter stripes you get on the common hawker. There's the common hawker for comparison. The lesser emperor has occurred quite widely in, in Britain, even turned up on uh, the Scottish islands on occasions as a vagrant during hot weather um, plumes coming from the continent. It's one of um, two emperors with, um, at least in the males, a conspicuous blue saddle, a blue base to the abdomen. The um, they typically turn up during midsummer, and males will often 
be pursued by emperor dragonflies when they occur in the same um, habitat, which is uh, reedy lakes and ponds typically. The lesser emperors, however, have very obvious brown thorax. So if you think you've got a lesser emperor, do focus on the colour of the thorax. Pretty bright green in, in the case of the emperor dragonfly, brown in lesser emperor. And the blue typically just restricted to the base of the abdomen in these. The wings often a little bit suffused, as in this individual. And the eyes rather duller than in the emperor. But certainly we think breeding at a few locations now, mainly in the southeast. So worth keeping an eye open for and mostly turning up as males and admittedly therefore mostly migrant males. There's one in flight, so you can see the obvious brown thorax contrasting with that blue saddle that goes right round. The emperor, by comparison, the green thorax and the blue visible typically all the way along the side of the side of the abdomen. OK, so just a word or two about the British Dragonfly Society. We uh, educate, record and conserve dragonflies. We have a, a very uh, good and useful website. We maintain a, a database of all of Britain's dragonfly records. And you can contribute to those, particularly if you think you've seen some of those rare ones, by submitting your sightings and indeed any photos uh, to iRecord, um, which is run, operated, and maintained by the Biological Records Centre. All of those records are at least annually um, moved up to the National Biodiversity Network atlas the nbn atlas and there they're accessible to anyone so you can go onto the nbn atlas and search for dragonfly records in your local area for example and uh, and make use of those records okay thank you very much for listening and watching and don't forget if you want to uh, read a bit more about these species then there is uh, this rather good book available. Thank you.